Hello and welcome to the 3D Blu-ray Bunker. This is a place for us die-hard fans of 3D where we exclusively look at 3D Blu-rays and within that niche almost entirely focus on the quality of the 3D on offer. And unlike most reviews which take a detailed look at the film with a short comment at the end about the 3D, here we do things the other way around and hopefully by the end you'll have a better idea about whether this one might be worth adding to your 3D collection. Today we're looking at Inferno. This was filmed in Academy Ratio, so that's 1.37 to 1, and obviously, like all 3D films of the 1950s, this was shot natively on 35mm film. Now, I'm embarrassed on two counts here. First of all, despite having been a 3D fan from a very early age and reading about 3D films long before the dawn of the internet, I hadn't actually heard of Inferno, and worse still, I wasn't familiar with its leading lady, Rhonda Fleming. Um, which, having uh, seen the film now, feels like a fairly shameful lack of knowledge on my part. And I should mention the efforts of the 3D Film Archive and a guy called Bob Fermanek there, who I think was the driving force behind this release, as well as its fabulous restoration here, uh, uh, along with several other 3D classics. And as soon as the film gets underway, you realise right away that they knew exactly what they were doing back then, and you maybe wonder why the 3D here looks better than a lot of modern films shot digitally nearly 70 years later. And just to emphasise that point, yes, this film is getting on for 70 years old, but the crystal clear Technicolor stereo cinematography on show here can sometimes make it feel like it could have been filmed yesterday. I say that they knew how to do it back then, but I suppose I do have to mention uh, what I think are two very tiny problems with the 3D here. Uh, and the first is right at the start, where the credits are placed in a really strange place on the Z-axis, and uh, I'd go as far as to say that I think they're in the wrong place. Their depth placement makes them feel like they're sitting in the middle of the image, and it's an odd effect that's quite uncomfortable to look at, and I'm sure it wasn't intended to, to look like this. In fact, if you watch the opening in 2D, uh, with the perspective font that's been used, the credits actually feel more three-dimensional than in the 3D version. Uh, but anyway, it's a very minor issue. So, uh, from the beginning, we get a very bright and colourful image, and there's not a single dark and murky shot in the film. And also, right from the start, the 3D is solid and impressive. It's one of those films where every single shot is obviously in 3D, and you never have that annoying feeling that you're not convinced that what you're seeing is in 3D. Uh, actually, there is literally one shot in the, in the whole film, which is this view across a landscape towards a building, that has a problem with it. Uh, there's something wrong uh, here that I'm guessing was maybe a result of the restoration being unable to source both the left and right images. Uh, it just doesn't work in 3D at all. It's not that the left and right are transposed either. It's one of those eye-twisting moments where there's too much conflict in between the left and right view. But one duff shot in an 83-minute film is uh, pretty good going, I would say. All of the close-up shots of people's faces are clearly solid and three-dimensional, and close-ups elsewhere show really nice solidity, uh, like with this revolver, where you can see the cylinder in, in great 3D, and even the depth of the individual chambers within the cylinder. The production design certainly looks like it was carefully staging shots for the third dimension. Uh, you can see throughout the film that people and objects are placed with depth in mind. Uh, you don't get people filmed up against walls or empty skies. There's always something in the frame to draw you in. This runway scene appears to do it almost to the point of drawing attention to itself. The placement of that sign looks like it was done more for the benefit of 3D, and I suppose plot, rather than putting it where it might actually naturally be found at an airport. Uh, there are quite a few pop-out moments spread throughout the film. Early on we see this aeroplane coming towards us. Uh, it's done slowly enough to appreciate it and uh, these falling rocks last for about a second so you can get a feeling for what's happening there but some of the other moments like is really uh, frequently the case in 3D films uh, are just a few frames long and uh, they happen before you can properly begin to appreciate them like uh, this this moment here where a knife is thrown at the camera and a stick thrown at the camera and during the climax of this film they ramp these up a bit and they save their most pronounced and mostly better executed uh, pop outs for the finale uh, one of which is an object being thrown at the camera which they put on a wire to make its trajectory uh, last a little bit longer I suppose some of these moments do fall into the 3D gimmick category, uh, but I'm definitely not complaining about any of them. Uh, we find out early on in the film that one of the characters has to make his way down a cliff face, and this shot here is his viewpoint. And whilst it's clearly in 3D, actually it's a slightly disappointing shot from my point of view, partly because the cliff isn't exactly the most daunting looking rock face that I've ever seen. 
uh, which I guess was a limit of the filming location, uh, and also because I think it could maybe have benefited from an increased stereo bass to exaggerate the depth involved. Uh, thinking about it also, though, I guess hanging a huge um, twin 35mm camera rig over a cliff probably wouldn't have been very easy either. Although when we see him here attempting his descent, the 3D does uh, still clearly add to the drama, and it's one of those shots that after you've seen it in 3D, seeing it in the in the 2D version, it just loses a massive amount of its impact. Um, speaking of the location, a lot of this film was shot out in the Mojave Desert, and it looks really nice here. There are shots of the plants out there, and some of these, like this moment here, uh, are a really good example of how native 3D will almost always make things like plants and trees look better in 3D than post-converted films can ever do, just because there's too much detail in them to convert convincingly. And this shot, for example, just looks excellent. It's fully solid and realistic, and you can clearly see where every twig belongs. Uh, in a way that would be completely impossible to see in 2D. And in fact, next time you watch a post-converted film with a shot of someone behind grass or anything like that, just notice how unimpressive it'll look. There's a moment here, too, where the rock in the bottom left of the screen is right in the foreground, uh, and it's clearly a separate rock from the one immediately behind it, but again, in 2D, it would be virtually impossible to distinguish between them. Uh, that might sound like an incredibly minor and pointless observation, but for me, it's one of the fundamental beauties of stereoscopy, the way that it can make sense out of a shot and reveal things in it that 2D just can't do. Another thing about good 3D that I, I really love is the way that the realism that it creates can almost act like a time machine in bringing moments from the past to what feels like is right within your grasp. Uh, and that's an effect that it is, I think, at its most uh, potent when looking at people and all the more so when it's people from a long gone age. Uh, so I don't know about you, but when I see Rhonda Fleming here in gorgeous Technicolor in fully three-dimensional form, I really do feel like I've stepped into her world of 70 years ago, or, or she's stepped into my world of today, and it really can be quite an overwhelming feeling. I, I suppose that maybe some people can get that from uh, 2D black and white, and perhaps I'm just so unimaginative that I need all the work done for me with technology, but I find these stunning 3D shots can have an almost profound effect. I don't usually pay too much attention to colour design in films, but the green chair here and the green lampshade bring out the green in her eyes, and um, ah, goodness me, what an amazing looking woman, and she is definitely at her most beautiful, I think, when, uh, when you see her in 3D. Uh, Rhonda Fleming actually appeared in some other 3D films, uh, Hivaro and Those Redheads from Seattle, both of which are also available on Blu-ray, and uh, thanks again, I think, to the superb efforts of the 3D Film Archive. Now, I find this bit interesting. Here she is uh, looking incredible still, of course, uh, about to use a pair of binoculars. And I'm sure you're probably like me in that I've always wondered why films show the wrong point of view shot when someone's looking through binoculars. They always show that stupid view of two slightly connected circles when anyone who's ever used a pair of binoculars knows that uh, you just see one big circular view. And more significantly, what you see is a highly exaggerated 3D view. Uh, I, I know the very first time uh, that I was consciously aware of 3D was when I, I think I used my father's binoculars one day when I was about six years old, and I was absolutely amazed at how three-dimensional the view was, um, probably only figuring out years later that, that this was because the uh, lenses were set much further apart than human eyes. And from that moment on, I was hooked on 3D and 3D photography. Uh, so uh, what view, I wonder, does Rhonda Fleming get? slightly disappointing. It's not the full twin circle nonsense, but it's still not the single circle that it should be. And worse still, it's not a hyper stereo view either. This of course is not something that I'm holding against the film, uh, but it would have gone up to absolute legendary status in my mind if they'd done this scene correctly. Uh, I'd be interested to know actually if anyone knows of a 3D film that does do this properly. Uh, I can't think of any, but, uh, but let me know if you can. Anyway, you can tell I'm a big fan of the 3D in this one. It's clear and obvious from start to finish, and it adds a lot to the look and the drama of the film. And aside from a handful of pop-outs, most of the 3D here is about depth and drawing you in. It looks gorgeous for a film from the early 50s, and almost certainly is better looking uh, on this Blu-ray uh, than it would have been in any cinema back when it was released. Uh, so very briefly to the movie itself, when somebody says to me 1950s film noir, what I picture is a shadowy black and white film. Uh, but this film noir is super colourful and super bright, uh, and it, it also has a, a more modern feel uh, than I'd have expected. And by that I mean that character motivations and behaviours are a lot more believable than I'm perhaps used to from films of this vintage. Um, the story's about a woman, that red-headed inferno herself, Rhonda Fleming, 
and her lover, who we join at the beginning of the film, just after they've left her husband for dead out in the desert. And it follows his attempts to survive and their attempts to get away with the crime. It's another film that would have remained totally off my radar if it hadn't been for this 3D release. And had that been the case, I, I would have missed out on a real gem of a film. Uh, I've seen most of the 50s 3D Blu-ray releases, and I think this is one of the greats from that golden age. And it's one that I think you really ought to have in your 3D collection. So I hope you found this in some way useful, and if so, I hope you'll join me again soon for another 3D Blu-ray review. Until then, thanks for looking in on this one. Cheers for now. Bye-bye.